we've been seeing in the last, however, since since October seventh, and so you know, I in I think in London it was a half a million people, and what what, what do you think of that? Well, you know, actually quite interesting uh, to have seen that um, because all of the you know elected officials and politicians they are now what what we imported anti-Semitism, and I'm like, yeah, you think? So it's like, yeah, this is what's been going on, right? And now they're seeing it. They're almost, they're flustered. How, how could that have happened? Well, I mean, if you import mi millions and millions of people from cultures that have deep-rooted anti-Semitism, that is what you get. That's exactly what you will get. Um, in Germany, they're already like uh, spinning it in a way uh, to shift the blame away from those that are actually out on the streets literally calling for the genocide of Jews to shift the blame, take it away from them, and once again blame uh, the, the Western societies. So in Germany they came up with this narrative, well, it is not their anti-Semitism, it's our anti-Semitism, because we have failed to integrate them. Seriously, this is how you spin this now? Well, what, was there an effort to integrate? Because, I, I mean, it's almost like, at least in, in Canada and, and America to some extent, with this sort of idea of multiculturalism, it was like it was seen as a racist or some kind of anathema to, to even think of that. Like, how, what, right? How, how could you try to assimilate them to our cult, to well, Western culture? Right? I mean, you know, first of all, um, the ones that uh, a society should in, or wants to integrate, the condition on that is, or the prerequisite, would be the people wanting to be integrated. Right. And um, I will have to say uh, in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of Turkish people coming and uh, they wanted to work in, in Germany and they did work in Germany. Right. Uh, and the idea was actually they were, would come and stay for some time, work and then go back. Well, that didn't happen. Right. But now we are so overrun and it's, it's almost like you have these parallel societies. Why should they integrate on top of all of that? Um, we are being taught to hate our own way of life, to hate our, our culture. Um, you know, why would anyone want to integrate in a society that hates itself? It, it's, it's insane. It's absurd. Like I said, on the, on the uh, altar of diversity and, and kindness and what have you not, we are actually destroying our, our liberal and free societies. In many Western democracies right now, Many people have been shocked by the incredible levels of extreme anti-Semitism to the point of advocating for genocide and death and, and, and so forth that, is, that has been displayed, right? Why? And so I think you're arguing that this is a result of not having assimilationist policies or letting people in at all. Like, that's what I'm trying to understand. Well, it, it's not only a, a result of, of uh, not being able, able to assimilate uh, a certain population groups. I think it was yesterday or the day before there was a hearing, I think it was in, in the Senate or Congress, and um, they were just asked a simple question. Would or does calling for the genocide of Jews violate your uh, rules of procedure of harassment? Would that be considered harassment? And these representatives of these universities, they were not capable of simply saying yes. So they were kind of rationalizing it, going like, well, it depends on the context. At MIT, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate MIT's code of conduct or rules regarding bullying and harassment, yes or no? If targeted at individuals not making public statements. Yes or no? Calling for the genocide of Jews does have, not constitute bullying and harassment? I have not heard calling for the genocide for Jews on our campus. But you've So those would not be according to the MIT's code of conduct or rules? That would be um, investigated of, as harassment if pervasive and severe. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment, yes. I, I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. 
This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. So is your if testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it uh, is, if the, yes or becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment, yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? The speech is not harassment? This is unacceptable, Ms. McGill. I'm gonna give you one more opportunity for the world to see your answer. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be harassment. The answer is yes. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as an individual. Targeted as, at an individual. It's Do targeted at basic? Jewish students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Do you understand that dehumanization is part of anti-Semitism? I will ask you one more time. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? Anti-Semitic rhetoric. When it and is it anti-Semitic rhetoric? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it crosses into conduct that amounts to bullying, harassment, intimidation, that is actionable conduct and we do take action. So the answer is yes, that calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard code of conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. What context do you need? You know, calling for the genocide of a people? Yeah, that is, that is harassment. There's no question about it. You don't need any context. They were not capable of doing that. So and it kind of, um, you know, begs the question, why it might be Islamophobia, the ones that are not capable of calling uh, uh, or of, of considering the calling for genocide of the Jews as harassment, they are the ones that are afraid of Islam because they know perfectly well what representatives of Islam are capable of. Charlie Hebdo, remember? We had it in Denmark. There were flags burning all over because someone dared to come up with, a, with, with some caricature for uh, uh, um, Mohammed. These are the Islamophobes, the true Islamophobes. I think casting a, a whole blanket across the entirety of the religion is, is, is way too far. Is that, is that what you're saying? It's the ideology that I fight. It's not the Muslims. They just want to live their lives. It's kind of like we are back to the incremental steps. First you put you know, your daughter under a scarf, then it's a niqab, then it's a hijab, then it's, you know, as it moves along, that kind of thing. And we're seeing that in the Western democracies, actually, especially in Europe. You know, when you're talking about these, the presidents of these Ivy League schools, this is all happening in a context of, um, for example, misgendering someone on those campuses is considered violence. Exactly. Like that is very overtly seen right. as something almost, I guess, right. worse than harassment. Right. That's actually what, where I was driving at, is like the cognitive dissonance. For How young people, especially in the Western democracies, once again, you know, take to the streets and they chant, you know, from the river to the sea. If you were to ask them, what river are we even talking about here? They wouldn't even be able to name the river, right? So it's just this, you know, it's the current thing to do, a virtue signaling. Even EU Parliament is not capable of just standing up and saying, no, we will not uh, be apologetic about what Hamas did. They have not found it necessary to finally stop funding um, the Hamas uh, political system uh, and funding school books, which are full, full of uh, anti, not only anti-Semitic slurs, but, you know, openly calling for the death of Jews. And the EU is funding these school books. And we haven't stopped. So the hypocrisy, once again, is staggering. This sort of nonchalant, you mentioned the word nonchalant, right? I mean, I, I can't help but think back to uh, Matthias Desmet's work, you know, the psychology of totalitarianism, the right. current thing, the nonchalantness, is just this. But the this, this banality of evil, the Hannah banality, Arendt. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because you said they have no idea what river it is. They might not even fully grasp that they're right. chanting, eliminate the Jews exactly. from this entire piece of land and things like that. Yet, you know, the, the thing that, that people can't see 
or find it difficult to see in these circumstances is how does the, the rhetoric, how does, that, how does that translate to actual genocidal behavior, right? Yet, I, I think history is ripe with this, right? With, with that, but we, you, you just can't imagine that something like that could happen. As Heraclitus said, a Greek philosopher, the truth often evades being recognized due to its utter incredibility. That's pretty much what happened in Nazi Germany, too. It was so unimaginable, but yet it happened. But even most Jews did not believe what they were about to experience because it was unimaginable. The, atro the extent of the atrocities that were afflicted upon them, they couldn't f grasp it. So they thought, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But yet it did. Yet it did.